I've been really amazed over the last year or so how quickly and how willingly everyone's been ready to change how they lived. Uh, we've stopped doing things that were just part of life. We've stopped shaking hands. We've stopped hugging friends. We've stopped singing at church and a number of us have stopped going into our offices for work. For a while, last March and April, we pretty much stopped doing everything. We didn't stop any of this for fun. In fact, it often hurt a bit to give up these things, didn't it? But we stopped them because we were confronted by a really big, inescapable truth. There is a global pandemic and it's serious. <clears throat> I remember early on, uh, as things were just starting and there was lots of debate about whether uh, COVID was merely just like the flu with people, people arguing that we don't make big changes like this for the flu. So why would we make big changes for this? But then we started hearing news that was quite confronting, didn't we? From around the world, it was shocking. People were dying in large numbers. Places like Italy, like New York, Hospitals were overwhelmed and overrun. People were, were dying in corridors. Morgues were overcrowded and, and some people were even uh, buried on an island in New York. Doctors and nurses and paramedics had to make shocking decisions about who they could try to save and, and who they just simply couldn't. The inescapable truth that there was a pandemic that would bring devastation if, if nothing changed, if we continued life as normal, that affected us. It meant things had to change, didn't it? And we had to learn to live in the light of COVID. <clears throat> well, believe it or not, but Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, is a little bit like this, just better. In chapters one to three, Paul has outlined big, inescapable truths, wonderful truths, truths of life and of light. He's outlined the blessings that God has given to his people in Christ, choosing them to be his children. And he's outlined God's plan, his plan to unite everything under the lordship and authority of the Lord Jesus. And this is a process that he's already begun in the church, in founding the church. God has brought people, different people from different places and different backgrounds together and made them into one body, reconciling them to himself and to each other, smashing down the barriers. And God's gift of grace, he's saved people, not to be on their own, but to be united in churches. And these, these churches, including our own, are living signposts, living billboards, showcasing God's work and God's plan and God's wisdom to all the world, to all the universe and the, even the spiritual beings and powers that watch on. This is God's marvelous plan. God has saved us, you and me, and he's brought us together in Christ, in this church. This is the big inescapable truth. So how does this truth change how we live? Well, that's what Paul gets to in chapters four to six of Ephesians. And we start here in verse one of chapter four. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. For the next few chapters, Paul is going to explain what it looks like to live life in the light of these big truths, to live life worthy of the calling to which God has called us. And he's going to cover a whole range of issues. But today we're just looking at the first few verses, verses 1 to 16 of chapter 4. And we're going to look at this under two headings. We're going to reflect on how Paul urges us to live. Firstly, he urges us to strive for unity. And secondly, he urges us to serve for maturity. Strive for unity, serve for maturity. Since we're going to 
come to hear what God has to say, what Paul urges us and how he urges us to change and to live, it's good that we pray. So let's pray now. Heavenly Father, please open our eyes to the wonderful things you've written in your word. <clears throat> and as we think through this passage today, please work in our hearts and change us according to your purposes and for your glory. Amen. Well, the first way that Paul wants these big truths from Ephesians 1 to 3 to change the Ephesian church and to change us is he wants us to strive for unity, to strive for unity. And he describes this in three steps or three attitudes or, or character traits uh, from verses 1 to 3. So have a look there with me at verses 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, <clears throat> I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. That's attitude one. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's attitude two. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That's attitude three. And we'll think about these in turn. So he calls on them to be humble and gentle. Verse two. I don't know about you, but this actually comes as a bit of a surprise. After the big discussion of God's plan in chapters 1 to 3, perhaps you might expect that, that Paul would say, therefore, go and do something amazing. In the light of this, go and do great things for the kingdom or press hard or fight for the cause or show how all our opponents are wrong. But instead, Paul urges, he begs us to be humble and gentle, completely humble and gentle, he says. Always knowing that others are more important than ourselves. Not insisting on things working to suit me, but insisting that they work to suit other people. Never, ever ridiculing others, especially when we disagree with them or think that they're wrong. I think we as Christians can tend to forget this, can't we? Especially when it comes to talking about heated things like politics. And it's always ugly to see Christian brothers and sisters ridiculing each other, calling each other names, using uh, terms to describe and denigrate others, attacking each other, gossiping at each other. And it's so much more ugly when it's within a church. Instead, Paul says, we're called to be gentle, to talk kindly to each other and about each other, especially when we think the other person is wrong, and especially when they frustrate us. And speaking of being frustrated, Paul next urges us to be patient and to bear with one another. See that in verse 2 to bear with one another in love. You know what's interesting about this one? Paul assumes that there will be people at church who frustrate us. That's just a given, that's an assumption. People who will annoy us for whatever reason, because we're different, we're all different. And Paul urges, he begs us to be patient with them, to bear with them in love, week in, and weak out. This doesn't mean that ungodly or unhelpful behavior should go unaddressed. And he speaks about that elsewhere in the New Testament, about doing that. But it means that he wants us, he urges us to work hard at making our first response, our first instinct to someone who frustrates us or annoys us, to, to, be, to be patient with them to bear with them, to love them. He's building here on the first, uh, the first attitude, isn't he, of, of being gentle and humble. Now he says, be patient, bear with one another in love, even when we think they are wrong, even when they haven't apologized when they've hurt us. Paul urges us 
to bear with them. To recognize that God is at work in them and in, in, in all of us, slowly but surely shaping us and, and changing us into the image of Christ so that they eventually might come round and see the error and come and, and uh, repent and say sorry and try to make things right. But we also might come to see that we were the one who was wrong all along. He urges us to be patient, to bear with one another. And the third attitude, building on the previous two, he says in verse 3, make every effort to maintain the unity. Every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. God's Spirit dwells in us. That's what happens as we're converted, as we come to Christ, and as we're brought together into his church. Right now, as a church, we are united spiritually. You see that in verses four to six, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, <coughs> one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, just one. There is one, one faith. We are united in these things if we're in Christ. But as we all know, Living out this oneness, living out this unity takes effort. Getting on with other people all the time takes effort. It takes work. Living at peace with others takes work. And Paul urges us, he begs us to work, to strive, to make every effort to keep the peace and this is hard isn't it this is so hard sometimes i don't want to make every effort to uh, keep the peace and restore relationship with someone they frustrate me they annoy me sometimes i don't want to make any effort at all make every effort he says imagine someone at church hurts you in some way Something they've said, maybe they were careless. Maybe they didn't even realise what they were saying or what they did. Whose responsibility is it to work towards reconciliation? Theirs? Well, yes. But it's yours as well, Paul says. Paul says that the responsibility is on us, on each of us, to make every effort if you know that you have a broken relationship with someone at church, whether from their actions or, or from your actions or, or most likely from both of your actions, have you been working, have you been making every effort to restore that relationship or every effort to at least be at peace with them? Or have you just held on to that grudge? Have you just been hoping that it'll go away? Now, I should note that I don't think Paul is, is mandating this for every single situation. In, in other letters, particularly in 1 Corinthians, he describes reasons why some might be actually told to leave the church because of what they're doing. But let's not go trying to find loopholes or exceptions. If you truly believe that there's an exception in your circumstance, you may be right. But come and speak to me or speak to one of the other pastors or to someone that you trust and ask, is this an exception or should I actually make every effort to be restored, to be at peace with this person who, who hurt me? I also don't think that Paul is suggesting that everyone at church is going to be the closest of friends because once you have more than about 10 people in a church, it's just not even possible nor is it necessary, but he is suggesting, or rather he is urging, that we be on good terms with everyone at church, as far as it's up to us, as far as it is possible to be united, to display this magnificent unity that Christ has bought with his own precious blood. Be willing to strive, being willing to make every effort to keep and to display this unity in our relationships at church. This is hard, isn't it? 
But what steps do you need to take, do you think? Can you sometimes be a bit abrasive? Do you realise that actually when I'm talking to people, sometimes people get upset? You find yourself in, in heated discussions or arguments more often than other people. Maybe you catch yourself complaining about what is going on or complaining about someone or how things are run. Do you need to grow in gentleness? Do you need to grow in humility? Do you need to grow in patience, in bearing with that one person that you find frustrating, that you find a challenge? Do you need to begin the process of restoring a relationship or at least bringing peace to a broken relationship? These things are hard. And we need to pray to God that he'll help us. And we need to ask others that we trust to help us in this. Through Paul, God is urging us to strive for unity, to strive for unity. And if we are honest, this is hard work. Really, it's actually impossible work. But in the next season, next season, in the next section, we'll see that Jesus gives us help for this task. And the help is actually each other, ironically. And we're going to see this in verses 7 to 16, where through Paul, God urges us to serve for maturity. Serve for maturity. Well, after giving us the impossible task of striving for unity and calling us to do it anyway, Paul describes some of the help that Christ gives to us. Uh, he actually shows grace to us in giving us gifts. See verses 7 to 8. Now to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says... When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Uh, in simple terms here, Paul is describing the grace that Jesus gives each one of us and actually to us as a church as a whole, as a direct result of his victorious resurrection and ascension. Uh, in verse 8 here, Paul is paraphrasing from Psalm 68, verse 18, which speaks of God in terms of a conquering king leading a, a victory procession through the city uh, with captives from the enemy in tow and receiving gifts of praise from his people. But the image here in Ephesians 4 is of Jesus risen, ascending to heaven victorious with his own rescued captives in the procession and actually overflowing in grace to his people, that he is the one who gives gifts to his people. And what are the gifts that he gives? Well, we see that in verse 11. He gives people. Verse 11, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. <laughs> Now, the New Testament uh, talks about various gifts that God gives his church. Sometimes it's described as from God, sometimes more specifically from the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, uh, and this time from Jesus. And that the gifts in the New Testament encompass all various different types of things. But here, the gifts are described as being from Jesus and they are people given to his church to enable it to grow in maturity and love. Uh, first mentioned here are the apostles, because it's on their teaching that the, the church is founded. We see that in Acts chapter 2. They were the ones sent by Jesus to be witnesses of him and his resurrection. They heard his teaching and they passed it on to others after his ascension. They stand behind the Bible, behind the books of the New Testament. They are it's either its authors or its sources. And second mentioned are the evangelists who have the privilege of sharing the evangel, the gospel is what it's called, with the world. And as the gospel is passed from person to person, 
from generation to generation, God works in the hearts of people, bringing them to faith. And he changes them from the inside out as out of response to his gospel. Third, I mentioned the pastor teachers. This is two actually rolled into one. They are the ones with the privilege uh, nowadays of teaching God's word, the, the apostolic teaching and of shepherding and guiding and loving and praying for God's people and pointing them to Jesus, reminding them of the hope that is found in him, encouraging people to trust him right up until and even beyond their dying breath. Now, with such a, a list of people given to the church, you might think that these are the ones who are given the job of service, the job of ministry, but you'd be wrong. Their job, we're told, is actually to equip God's people to do the works of service, to do the works of ministry. See there in verses 11 to 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The works of service here, uh, otherwise translated ministry, is the work that we are all called to. You, me, uh, the person sitting beside you. If we are in Christ and part of his church, then we have a job to do, to serve one another, to minister to one another, so that we all together as a church grow in maturity. And it's the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, uh, and the pastor teachers who are the ones who, are, uh, who enable and equip all of us to do that ministry, to do that work. That's our job. So what do you think a mature church looks like? Uh, is it one that is doctrinally sound? Well, yes, but it's more than that. It's a church where each person actively, actively works to serve other people, to talk to other people, to pray with other people, to love other people, to care for other people. Do you feel that we are a mature church? Do you feel that you are a mature Christian? Do you actively work to serve others? Do you turn up to church each week asking, how can I serve someone today? Who can I serve today? That's maturity. That's real maturity. Of course, we've got lots of formal ways that people serve at church with various rosters and roles and things that happen to enable our service to, uh, to function and our youth ministry and children's and all that sort of thing. But the biggest opportunity for service is to serve each other, to serve the, purple, the, purple, the people at church, pointing each other to Jesus, speaking words of truth to each other, and speaking these truths in love and in gentleness and in humility, sharing our struggles with each other, being humble enough to actually share the struggles, our failures, not necessarily with everyone, but with some. Sharing our joys, making meals for other people, inviting other people into our home, writing cards for other people, praying for others, sharing our answered prayers, sharing what God has been teaching us in his word and in our lives, turning up early to encourage new people who might be here, turning up week by week to encourage everyone. 
It's, it's these things, it's these acts of service that seem so small and so insignificant on their own. But when you add them up across a church and you add them up week by week and month by month and year by year, they're incredible catalysts for growth and maturity. And it's this growth and maturity that God uses to protect us as a church from all kinds of destructive influences. See verses 14 to 16. <clears throat> then he says, when we are mature as a church, we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. COVID has been a big, inescapable reality that's changed so much. It's changed the way that we live in so many ways. Well, Paul wants the Ephesian church and he wants us to recognize the work that God is doing in the world and his plan as, and his big inescapable reality, his big inescapable truth, the biggest truth. And he urges us to live lives that are shaped by this truth, to strive, to really strive to live out unity in our church, the church that Jesus died for and to serve each other, to work hard at serving each other so that we grow in maturity. This isn't the uh, end of the matter. We're going to pick up where we leave off today next week with a whole lot more implications across uh, chapters 4, 5 and 6. But these two things, striving for unity and serving for maturity, are enough for us to be thinking about today, to be praying about, to be planning in how we can grow in these things this year. And so I encourage you at the end of this to take a few moments to think, to plan out what kind of practical steps you can take to strive for unity here at church. What do you need to pray about? What do you need to grow in? Who do you need to talk to? Who do you need to apologize to? Who do you need to uh, initiate, reinitiate contact with and show forgiveness to? And I want us to think also about how we can serve others. What practical steps can you take to serve your brothers and sisters here at church so that we all together grow in maturity and Christ-likeness. I'll pray. Heavenly Father, please work in us. Grow us in these things that are so hard, that are so countercultural, that are so contrary to our natural desires. Help us to strive for unity, to make every effort, and help us to serve one another so that we grow in maturity. Amen.